Good morning and welcome to the AVS eTalk on design, realization, applications of gas and ion separations materials with Tina Nennoff with Sandia National Labs. This is a one hour free webinar and we'd like to thank you for joining us. I'm going to go through a few intro slides before we have Tina take over the screen and do her presentation. When you logged in, you're automatically muted. Be sure your volume is up and that your screen is in full view. Again, this is a one hour presentation with no scheduled breaks. However, we will have a Q&A option at the end of the presentation. So please look for that feature at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions along the way, please feel free to type them in and we'll review those uh, when the presentation is complete. A few disclaimers. This presentation is based on sources believed to be reliable, but the AVS and authors instructors disclaim any warranty or liability based on or relating to the contents of this e-talk. Disclaimer two, AVS and its authors instructors do not endorse any products, processes, manufacturers, or suppliers. Nothing in this e-talk should be interpreted as implying such an endorsement. And our copyright notice, the material contained in this e-talk was copied with the permission of authors and instructors of the notes who obtained copyright releases from other materials. Since the AVS does not own the copyright of the material in this e-talk, permission to use any part of this material must be obtained from the presenter today. Uh, we do have some upcoming short course, our last one of 2022 on atomic layer deposition via our AVS Mid-Atlantic chapter. This is taking place next week. If you're interested in this course, please register online. We plan to have more courses in 2023 and are looking for help from you. Uh, if you fill out our courses by request, if there's a course you're interested in us scheduling, please let us know. If you have an idea for 2023 e-talks or webinars, we have a couple of contacts. Matthew Jordan is our e-talk coordinator and Dave Adams, our webinar coordinator. Please reach out to them if you have a topic you'd like to see. Uh, we have some upcoming meetings. Our last one for 2022 is the PAC Surf meeting in Hawaii. It's a good one in December. If you need a vacation and or a conference to combine, please check it out. In 2023, we have several additional conferences. I'm gonna keep this short by directing you to our AVS events calendar. The website is down below, but you can go to our AVS website to find this information as well. If you're not already an AVS Platinum member, please consider joining to expand your network, enhance your scientific and professional knowledge, develop your leadership skills, and receive discounts on various events. Uh, you can go to avs.org to find out more about membership benefits, our technical library, publications, and journals. Students, it's a great time to find out about student chapters and career services and getting involved with AVS. And following today's training, we'll have an online evaluation form. Uh, in a separate browser for you. And at this time, I'd like to welcome Tina Nenoff to present design, realization, applications of gas and ion separations materials for you. Tina, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. I will begin sharing my screen. And we had a little bit of uh, connection issues earlier, so hopefully everything will work out. Please be patient with us as I bring this up. It shouldn't take a second. And again, for anybody who has questions, please remember to use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and we'll begin here shortly. And while this is coming up, I do want to thank the AVS and the organizers for the invitation and for the opportunity to present today. Um, and because of this slight funkiness of my uh, image here, I'm going to stop the video while speaking, but I'll come back on uh, for questions. So my name is Tina Nenoff. I'm a senior scientist at Sandia National Labs. Today, I'll be talking about design, realization, applications of gas and ion separation materials. Uh, my name's the only one here for now, but I do want to point out that um, I have a strong team of collaborators and I will highlight their work throughout the talk. So by way of outline, I'll give you a little bit of background. I'll focus in on some of the recent materials we've been working on, in particular with using rare earth elements to form nanoporous metal organic frameworks, and then transition into applications uh, that we're working on particular to sensors. So um, by way of background, nanoporous gas absorption materials are solid materials with uh, defined porosity. It's a combination of the porosity and the functionalization on those pores that enables selectivity and absorption. Three main categories I tend to dabble in and uh, we can use for comparison include activated carbons and charcoals, which generally have 
about 500 meters square per gram surface area. These are highly absorptive capacity. However, they have low selectivity. As you can see from the picture, they absorb whatever you need to. Uh, and they tend to have saturation from background gases. But in case of an emergency, in many cases, including nuclear accidents, this is a perfect material to just start uh, absorbing quickly. Uh, another class of materials are zeolites. They are aluminosilicate crystalline pores. Uh, there are about uh, 200 of them known. Um, they're highly crystalline. They have a set number of frameworks based on a thermodynamic favorability. Um, because they are aluminosilicates, they have a charge to them. And between the size and the shape, you can get certain selectivities. Uh, they have a lower absorption capacity because of the small pores, but are highly uh, thermally, chemically, and radiologically um, stable, and then also size and chemically selective. Generally, they are about 100 meters square per gram. And then what I'll primarily focus on today are metal organic frameworks. Uh, these are kind of a combination of, the, of both the carbons and the zeolites. They uh, are highly crystalline. Uh, they combine metal nodes, uh, which are sort of the corners. If you think of a tinker toy setup, um, they would be your corners. And then the ligands or the organic parts would be the connectors. And how you choose to the metals or the linkers enables you to do high design of different porosity and different uh, chemical functionality. Um, and uh, as an example, you'll see some work out of uh, Omar Yagi's group, some of the seminal work that shows that using the same metal center, but by extending the linkers, you can greatly extend the surface area inside the pore and therefore change the absorption capacity and selectivity. Um, based on one of the questions, I thought I'd add this slide. It's a lot here, but basically there were some questions on what's the difference between these absorption materials and polymers. And I, I want to not say that they're in competition, that they all have their unique uh, capability and uses. While polymers are pure organics that um, are easily processed, they have low cost and are very good for bulk separations and are used throughout the chemical and petrochemical industries. Uh, they do have disadvantages, which include uh, degradation, chemical and aging de degradation and separation purity limits based on uh, basically the, um, the pressure swings uh, that they're used at. If you want ultra high selectivity, uh, we tend to go to molecular sieves or nanoporous materials like I've been describing. Um, they do have their positives and negatives in processability as membranes, um, and therefore for various uh, industrial separations uh, may not be uh, the, the choice in comparison to polymers. And in many cases, they are the choice in comparison to polymers. But I just wanted to put that out there for um, information for whoever asked that question. Okay, so what, by way of background, this is a pretty busy slide, but I think all you really need to show is that uh, the, the middle box, that most of the work coming out of our groups is the design on the nanoscale, so at the atomic level, for the separation material to optimize what happens on the bulk scale. So the fundamental research of what is what we're doing in the lab has direct applications to industrial needs. And what we see in that bulk scale um, behavior, if it needs to be further optimized, we return back to the atomic scale. And so it's a, a sort of a feedback loop on itself. Um, we've done all different kinds of things from molecular sieves uh, to, for nuclear waste cleanup, to fission gas capture, to white light emitting sources, and industrial separations. And I'll spend a little bit of time focusing on the two things in the box here. All right, so uh, early in my career, um, the materials we thought of, uh, how did we come up with the idea on the fundamental scale? We went to geology. And so in particular, when looking for things that might be very selective for a certain ion, uh, by looking at what minerals exist with that ion is a very helpful place to start. It's particularly helpful if you're looking at nuclear waste cleanup, because in that case, in many instances, you have to have something that's very stable with time, and we're talking millennia in many cases. Um, and so my first task at Sandia was specifically to make uh, materials that were stable over the entire pH range to um, uh, ion select cesium out of uh, a very concentrated seawater solution. So that's one part cesium per 100,000 parts sodium, both monovalent cations. Um, and so uh, what we came up with using geology as a basis is the, are these crystalline silico titanates, uh, where it's a silicon and titanium 
in the vertices um, connected by oxygens. And what tends to happen on the very atomic scale is that we form the perfect pocket for a cesium ion in the, in the framework. And that enables, if you look at the lower left-hand corner, I'm not sure you can see my mouse or not, um, in our second uh, uh, sort of our improved generation, the top line, we have a, a material that's orders of magnitude high selectivity for cesium over sodium, which is generally what you find, what seawater is composed of. Um, and uh, unbelievably for a big bureaucracy like Sandia, in a very short period of time from 1993 to 1995, not only did we have the discovery and the fundamental understanding studies, but we also did scale up to commercialization. And this is now a, a commercial product uh, sold by Honeywell UOP um, as an ion sieve. Um, and then uh, sort of the work went away. It's a, Nuclear waste cleanup in the United States is very determined by the politics of Washington. So I went away for a while until, unfortunately, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant blew up, and that was in March 2011. About two weeks later, I received a call from the Secretary of Energy saying, we know you have a material. Uh, I worked very closely with UOP to have them relicense it. And within two months of the accident, 40,000 pound lots were being uh, re-licensed and reproduced. Uh, they were uh, inserted in the SARI process, which was uh, uh, developed by Toshiba because in Japan it was required to have a Japanese company leading the effort. So we uh, worked with them. Um, you can see from those photographs, uh, the, the workers in the white suits in the middle picture are for scale against one of the columns. And then it was uh, many rooms full of those columns. Uh, by August, 2011, the the materials were in the process, and by December 2015, 160 million gallons of cesium contaminated seawater were cleaned from the reactor buildings. So uh, that I personally feel is a, a high point in my career, and I love to show that real fundamental research is needed for real world applications. Another thing mid-career where we weren't so much geology focused, but now using computational materials and methods to help us design materials. This is work that was done by previous collaborators, Jeff Greathouse and Marie Parks, where we use density functional theory to approximate and uh, point us in the right direction of which metals in the, on the periodic table would have the strongest and more favorable binding of oxygen to separate it from air uh, than other components of air. And why this was important in particular was that uh, the way that air is generally separated for oxygen purification is cryogenic separations, which is a very costly, uh, we're talking trillions of BTUs uh, by the chemical industry. So quickly using computational design, using advanced computational design, which is ab initio molecular dynamics to uh, predict at room temperature and higher temperatures, uh, what the separations would be of nitrogen, which is the main component in air versus oxygen. Again, pointed is the right direction. Working with uh, Ina Savagallis and Karina Chapman, who's now at uh, SUNY Stony Brook, um, we were able to synthesize and characterize the new materials we made and then tested them to show that, yes, in fact, we had an oxygen separation material that above room temperature was preferential to oxygen versus nitrogen, which is a big deal considering currently uh, minus 77 is the temperature used for cryogenic separations. And that material is patented and is now in scale-up processes uh, by SBIR uh, licensing um, partners. Okay, so getting to what I really wanted to talk about today, um, this is uh, where we are today, and it's computationally driven, experimentally validated rapid materials discovery. And this is an Office of Science program called Uncage Me that's led out of Georgia Tech. What we really are looking at is the design and tune of adsorbents to selectively absorb industrial caustic acid gases. Um, and this cycle in the middle, I think, defines our philosophy uh, currently as best as possible, where we really are in a very tight feedback loop where we have computational design, leading material synthesis and characterization, leading to mixed gas adsorption, which then vol uh, validates the computational work. Uh, not only is it does it allow rapid materials discovery and processing, but it also um, enables uh, is enabled by the use of the supercomputers at Sandia. Um, and I'll just, uh, talk about that um, shortly. Okay, so why are we working with these materials? 
Um, Ina Sava Gallis, former postdoc of mine, who is currently a, a really um, established, well established uh, staff scientist here at Sandia, and uh, postdoc Susan Henkelis, were working uh, together uh, on different rare earth moths. Uh, while I was doing my patent, my literature searches and showing that uh, various transition metals really like uh, acid gases like H2S and SO2. And if you like them, that means you tend to bind to them. If you bind to them in a metal organic framework, it means you're not binding to the organic linker, which is the weak link that could break. So with that in mind, we started exploring rare earth elements with the linkers to form metal organic frameworks. Here is the general rather facile synthesis of a metal salt with the linker, DOBDC, uh, which is this uh, 2,5-dioxo, 1,4-benzene dicarboxylate, DOBDC. And uh, within two or three days, we get these beautiful crystalline materials. When you look at them crystallographically, you find that they actually have a very crystalline framework. They have uh, well-defined pores, um, and they have metal centers, which are rare earth elements. Um, without getting into too much detail, What's also very interesting about these is that they can have dangling bonds, which is a very rare thing in a 3D network uh, array. Dangling bonds usually means a defect that will cause the structure to collapse. But ours are actually synthesized with them, which shows an inherent thermodynamic stability, which is very important and very interesting for our work. So um, in these metal clusters, uh, with these transition metals, you can have a bidentate where the dangling part oxygens off the um, linker will both bind to the metal, or you can have one that is not binding, which means that there is a stability in the metal cluster holding it all together. So you, generally, we look at the europium, terbium, and euterbium. These are sort of our benchmarks, plus yttrium, which acts like a lanthanide but is not. Uh, this is our BET adsorption data. This is our speed, the way of measuring the internal surface area of our material. What we like to show is that no matter which element of the periodic table we're using, we end up with a high porosity open framework, which is great, which means we're, we're forming our 3D network. And then we use a lot of crystallography, X-ray crystallography, to understand how stable these materials are. So um, even if you are not a crystallographer or haven't seen any of these types of patterns before. I'll just step you through what's important. Uh, we have a pristine. So if you look at the yttrium DOBDC, the one right in the center, upper center, uh, we have a blue line, which is the pristine. We have an NOx exposure after one hour and then NOx exposure after 24 hours. NOx is nitrous oxide, which uh, is an acid gas. We generate it in our experiments in the lab uh, with water and present. So it's a mixed gas of NO2 or NOx and humidity. Uh, and we want to see under these harsh conditions, will this metal organic framework break down? And effectively, it does not break down. You can see the consistency of the peaks and the locations on no matter which uh, metal organic framework x-ray pattern we're looking at, which shows stability, which means that the acid gas is not breaking apart the ligands uh, from, the, from the framework. Going to the next slide, uh, getting into kind of the nitty gritty, we use uh, infrared spectroscopy uh, to understand uh, where the NOx species is binding. And what we found, in particular, Ina did a great job with this, is found that, the, that you can label the stretching and bending of the NO2 directly binding to the ligand. So it is not binding to the uh, metal center, but it's binding to the ligand, which is not really what we expected at first. But fortunately, it is not breaking apart the ligand. Uh, as a reminder, there is water present, uh, and uh, this pattern on the lower right-hand side shows the presence of water, NO, CO2, and NO2, meaning that um, all of those are adsorbed. So we know the water is in there, too. Generally, we believe that the water is binding to the metal uh, stronger than, say, the, the NO2. And interestingly, uh, when you make the materials, this, uh, if you look at the left side, uh, the photograph, these under UV light uh, show emissions from the materials. It's the metal centers are emitting. However, when you introduce NOx, uh, humid NOx, the, which is the red line on the patterns on the right, you actually see a quenching of that uh, emission. So somehow 
the introduction of the NO2 and the water is quenching that. So we turn to um, modeling to help explain some of these interesting characteristics. Um, and these uh, the folks pictured on the right, uh, Jessica Remza, who is my co-PI on this, and John Vogel, a former postdoc, excellent uh, person who is now a staff member, uh, turn to computational modeling, uh, specifically with F-electron containing systems. And, the, what, and if you see on the upper left-hand corner, that's the top part of our type feedback loop. And what uh, Jessica and John are doing, much like you saw some of the earlier work for the oxygen work, is doing 3D periodic structures uh, where they're using VASP um, and uh, DFT calculations to understand not only the binding energies, but also the effect of building a 3D structure. Is there any steric hindrance? Uh, or any hydrogen bonding interfering. Um, this was validated against some studies uh, out of the University of Alabama, Dave Dixon's group, who is a collaborator of ours, who tends to uh, work solely in coupled cluster modeling, uh, which is uh, computationally less strenuous, uh, but does uh, and gives very good energy calculations, but does not include uh, the three dimensional parts to it. And so uh, John and Jessica's work showed an important factor that when you are calculating the binding energy of our main gases, so NO2, H2O, or SO2, um, there are definite differences in the binding energies between NO2 and the others. Uh, and in, in looking at this center graph, basically uh, NO2 is binding, has a, has a weaker binding energy to the metal centers than the other gases, which now explains why we saw the NO2 binding to the ligand, because water, in this case, want, is preferentially binding to the metal centers, while the water has to bind somewhere, and it, I'm sorry, the NO2 has to bind somewhere, and so it goes to the ligand. And then John did further calculations, it's, this is the pictures on the right, that shows that there's a steric hindrance, um, or I should say a preferential binding, where the NO2 comes in in a linear manner, and the oxygen will bind to the metal center, but when you have water, it not only binds to the metal center, but it favorably hydrogen bonds to the ligand. So it's more favorable for the water to bind to the metal center. So this, these calculations now validate our material synthesis characterization and testing. All right, so furthermore, why did we quench the signal when the NO2 and water were absorbed? And John did some great calculations that uh, mimic the optical spectra and show that when you have NO2 present, which is the blue line on the left, it decreases uh, the absorption um, values versus just water or the as made. And then when he did the calculations, the electronic structure calculations, he showed if you look at the top on the right, you see the yellow blobs. That's Those are the electronic uh, orbitals. They tend to reside on the ligands. But when you introduce water, they stay on the ligands, they don't move. In comparison to the NO2, you see the energy, you see some of the yellow blobs now moving to where the NO2 goes, which means that it's a decrease of the um, electronic structure uh, on the moth and directly to the gas. So in effect, we now have uh, an optical sensor that tells us when we've absorbed an industrial gas, which is all very exciting to us. I won't go into this too much. A lot of it is because I'm hand waving and Jessica and John are really the experts. Um, but there, this is, we've now taken it to much more um, uh, competitive binding environments where we're now putting multiple gases in the pores and allowing them to compete. This requires ab initio molecular dynamics um, and it's done at temperature, uh, relevant temperatures. Um, uh, they basically showed the competitive nature based on the metal center and that the, uh, how the NO2 forms and how it binds to the linker uh, via these proton sharing um, uh, mechanisms. So, um, and that was an invited uh, paper that uh, John led that we recently published. All right, so, okay, so we've proved we have these materials, we proved that we can make them. Now uh, we wanted to see what is, what, how many can we make and what is the difference and do they actually change uh, their, their stability and do they change their selectivity? So this was a study led by Susan Henkeles, but also supported by John and Jessica, in which uh, we were able to make the entire series across the periodic table. If you haven't looked at your periodic table, it's the extra bar of elements down at the bottom. These are the lanthanides. 
you can see that there's a uh, ionic radius difference. Um, we did not do, let me see if I remember this correctly. I think it's plasmodinium because that's the radioactive one, um, but we did the rest of the series. And um, what I showed you on one of the very first slides was that we had a combination, well, we basically had monodentates and bidentates. What Susan was able to show, and I'll go into detail now, is that this is a kinetically driven process. Okay, so first off, um, she did a really great study um, where she was able to, by changing the ratio of the metal to the linker, um, be able to synthesize all these different series. Sometimes it took different temperatures and sometimes it took different days. However, um, she was able to show again by the lack of change in the X-ray pattern that we did make the, the actual same framework. And if you can see a slight shift uh, at the peaks around seven angstroms down on the bottom, you can see uh, there's a shift and that's primarily due as you look at the upper right-hand corner due to the ionic radius that you're including in the framework. I do want to call your attention to the synthesis ratio. There's this uh, M, and that is the modulator. I will talk about that later, so uh, just keep that in mind. Right, so what we were able to show is that there is actually a process, a crystallization process in most of these different elements, uh, whereby it goes from solution through a set of stages till you get to your final crystalline product. And so if you look at the neodymium DOBDC, and this would be in the chart uh, on the right, but it's the center column, you have a phase one, which has a lot of metal, phase two, which is sort of like nodular, phase three, which are little crystals, and phase four, stage four, which are much bigger crystals. And if you look at the difference on the chart between number one and number four, the amount of neodymium drops from 91% to 77%. And that's because it goes from the metal oxide to the linker incorporating and forming the 3D structure. And so this is really a neat way of seeing the process by which something grows. Um, however, having said that, I'm going to prove myself wrong in the case of the erdium, where nothing grows until it just forms the fully formed molecular uh, metal organic framework. But this was a really neat study in crystallization of phases. Uh, and what Susan was able to show using powder X-ray diffraction is that you get this mixture of monodentate and bidentate, which is what we originally showed if the linker in the middle combining the metal centers to it. But that if she let it grow longer, in many cases she had to because of the different metal organic frameworks took longer time, um, that actually it all formed by a uh, bidentate linking, meaning that there was no longer uh, this mix combined um, binding effects. Now we thought, well, what's the value? I mean, that's a nice chemistry, fundamental chemistry study. Uh, and if you look at the right-hand side, you can see the difference in the square of the unit cells between the two of them. But now we thought, well, we had premised the whole thing on saying that because we had the monodentate, we had higher stability. And now what does this mean for selectivity of gases? So again, we turn to John and Jessica. And now we compared, if you look at the right-hand side, the bidentate only, which is the top part, versus the monodentate bidentate combined. And um, the filled in squares, I mean, sorry, the filled in symbols, so the, the blue square, the red circle, and the green diamond, or the original calculations I showed you earlier in the presentation. Um, and then the open figures are uh, if you have just bidentate um, uh, binding. And what it does show us is that there is an effect uh, on which phase you grow for the preference of binding. Um, in all cases, NO2 is preferentially bound, um, yeah, uh, less, I'm sorry, is less strongly bound, so it's going to go to the linker, but that uh, based on what's going on in the metal, either SO2 or water will be preferentially bound. So uh, again, very interestingly, what happens on the atomic scale affects industrial bulk scale separations. All right, so having felt very solid about all this work and published it, and we had really good crystal crystallographic things, um, John was giving a talk uh, at the Pacific Chem uh, meeting last year when one of our colleagues at UT Dallas, uh, Ken Balkus, noted that they had made one of these transition uh, rare earth metal, uh, metal organic frameworks. 
And they thought that there was possibly fluorine doping. And we thought, where is fluorine coming from? Nobody's ever seen fluorine in a moth uh, in the middle. Um, and uh, so we turned to Jessica and Matt, our new postdoc, who we welcome here um, uh, to do the modeling. And Keith, who's a staff member who does NMR, to understand, is there actually fluorine in there? Uh, and so we looked at a number of uh, metal organic frameworks, including ours, to see if they're really in there. And where would it come from? And the only thing we could remember, and if you remember what I said earlier, we have these modulators that we use. They help in the crystallization. They are 2 -fluoro fluorobenzoic acid, and there is fluorine in them. We thought, oh, well, maybe there is fluorine. So we so combining computation, material sciences, material synthesis, and characterization, uh, Jessica and Matt were able to uh, computationally predict, A, what the structure would look like if you had hydroxides in them versus if you had fluorine. And then uh, they did a really intensive study, and this is an eye chart, so I don't want you to spend too much time worrying about it. But the take home message is they found that if you have fluorine in the structure, you have a more stable structure. And they calculated that there should be two different NMR peaks in there. Um, and I'll take you to the upper right hand corner chart, I think is the most important, which is the heat of formation, where they show um, that there is a decrease from zero fluorine to 100% fluorine. There's a decrease in the uh, in the formation energy, meaning it becomes more stable as you include fluorine. If you look at the solid lines, and if you look at the dotted lines, it shows it becomes even more stable if you have two fluorines in a cluster. So that all of a sudden is, is not only throwing, it's basically throwing me into a panic, but it should be throwing much of the metal organic framework community into a panic because a lot of us use modulators to grow our crystals. And so with these calculations, um, we then went to the experiment and working with um, Keith's work, he did a number of techniques. The first one, uh, so I'll start from the left, work my way to the right. He saw two fluorine peaks in, in, uh, in image A. The image in B is just some of the extra modulator. He was able to uh, deconvolute them to show that they were distinct two peaks, and they were basically at exactly the locations that Jessica had predicted. And then he did 2D uh, fluorine NMR. Sorry, those are some typos in there. Um, and he was able to show again that the general locations were anticipated as we had expected. Um, and then he used codex NMR where it's different spin states, and he was able to show on this lower right hand image that the fluorines that there were two and they were generally five angstroms or less 4.7 angstroms apart, which means that they were in the in the actual cluster together. Now, this is a really interesting fundamental research study, but what else does it mean? It basically means that we've been doing all this prediction of selectivity based on structures that do not contain fluorine. And what does that mean specifically to um, our bulk application process is selectivity. So Jessica and, and Matt, again, um, did some fabulous uh, modeling for us, which basically, again, did exactly the same calculations you saw in the charts before, where we used our four um, metal centers, yttrium, erbium, terbium, and ytterbium. We calculated the binding energies for water, NO2, and SO2, whether there was hydroxide or fluorine in the cluster. And um, to my great relief and everybody else's, it really fundamentally shows very little change. So it apparently stabilizes the cluster and framework to have fluorine in it, but it does not affect the binding energy because the fluorines are very deep in the clusters and are shielded uh, from the binding gases. So as uh, we were expecting the binding energy, the binding trend retains of water, SO2 and NO2 favorability to the metal centers um, and um, our predictions for industrial applications can hold. Okay, so that was pretty fundamental uh, work that we're doing. Simultaneously, we do application work. Um, and it's one of the things I really love about being at a national lab that you can do both at the same time, which is uh, sort of unheard of uh, in academic settings. So this is a slightly different group of people. My co-PIs are Leo Small and Mara Schindelholtz. Um, Stephen Percival is a great staff member, who, electrochemist who's joined the group. Matt Herlock is our new postdoc who's replaced Susan, who's moved on. Um, and so it's a really wonderful team. And what we're doing is 
using metal organic frameworks are MOFs that are based on DOBDC linkers for a direct electrical readout sensors. Why do we need direct electrical readout sensors? Uh, there's a the need to sense and identify individual gas pollutants from the complexity of environments requiring highly selective materials. So how do you have a sensor out in the world that is not getting uh, uh, giving false positives in particular or false negatives based on real world air components. Currently, many conductivity based devices fall into two categories. They're generally solid state, which require them to run at higher temperatures, so you have to have heating devices included, or they're fuel cell based, which requires liquid electrolytes, and those are easily fouled and difficult to use in a um, just out in the environment. So we're using MOFs based sensors. Um, and uh, we're really focused not only on uh, impedance-based uh, spectra um, sensing, but we're also focusing on our NO2. Uh, and let's see, uh, yes, and because we're doing impedance-based, we can work at really low power requirements, actually near zero. Okay, so how do we make these? Um, we are using platinum interdigitated electrodes. So this is this picture on the upper right-hand corner that's on a glass substrate with platinum uh, fingers going through um, the square area. Um, we are using our MOFs basically because they are so absorbent to their target gas molecules, we don't have to worry about any other gases getting involved. Um, so if, uh, in this case, we'll talk about a nickel MOF 74, which is a nickel, based metal organic framework, which uses DOBDCs, and that's this material on the sensor. And then we expose it to gases, uh, in this case, 5 ppm NO2 for eight hours at 50 C. And we get a direct uh, electrical readout. Uh, it's very low power consumption, and we're able to interrogate different gases. Um, and it's really important for things like degradation products or uh, industrial gas streams where you may have contaminants. Um, we're widely published on this for all different kinds of target gases, but I'll just focus on NO2 today. So we've worked with various materials that are targeted toward NO2. Again, if you know the target on the nanoscale, you can do bulk scale applications. Today, I'll talk about the metal organic framework in the, in the bottom center, the metal DOBDC material, so cobalt, magnesium, or nickel based. Um, like I was showing earlier, we have x-ray patterns to show that we uh, have the metal organic framework on the left. Uh, we know depending, doesn't matter what uh, metal we have, we have the same pattern. We know that it's porous. And then when we uh, put it on the glass substrate, if you look at the insert, we know we have the peaks of the main peaks of the metal organic framework. So we have the MOF on the uh, interdigitated electrode ready to go. Uh, Leo Small uh, has just done a phenomenal job at uh, leading the effort to design and build our test chambers. Uh, this is a custom built NO, well, it's basically any gas exposure now, uh, which enables us to put, we have thermocouples in it, we have gas imports, we have gas outports. Uh, so with mass flow controllers, we can very um, uh, finely tune the gases in, the gases out. Uh, this is made all out of stainless steel and it's inserted into a, a furnace so we can control the temperature. Uh, let's see, anything else I want to talk about here? Um, it's in speed and spectra recorded at zero volt DC and 100 millivolt uh, AC over one megahertz to 10 megahertz. So uh, we make our thin films. In this case, since we're doing basic research, we were just drop casting different metal organic frameworks to start. You can see from the image in the lower right hand side that we have thin films. This is a cross section, but they're not particularly beautiful uniform thin films. They just need to cover the platinum electrodes. Um, the difference is the cobalt and nickel contain a wide range of crystallite sizes, while the magnesium crystals were an order of 100 nanometers. The film thicknesses were generally 10 microns, and we do not need perfect uh, defect free films for this. What you see is based on the metal center, again, based on the selectivity of the NO2 gas to the metal center, we get a very different response um, and orders of magnitude response, specifically um, between the nickel versus the other two. And if you look at the impedance, which is on the lower left hand, left -hand corner, uh, you'll see a difference of about uh, order of magnitude of 10, uh, just when we're looking at the 
5 ppm NO2 for eight hours. Um, and if you want to get into the nitty gritty, you can actually see uh, the impedance versus the phase angle uh, to give you um, actual uh, impedance spectra for each sample. Um, what we can do also is cycle this material. Um, we'll take uh, an electrode. So if you're looking at the charts on the right, um, you cycle through uh, the white lines are N2, the gray lines are NO2, and you can cycle uh, NO on, I'm sorry, NO2 on, NO2 off, on and off, um, pretty much through the whole way. And you see the great uh, difference between the nickel and the magnesium and the copper. There is some noticeable uh, lack of uh, returning response, returning response to the original, um, and that's probably due to some uh, NO2 being trapped in the pores. But you can cycle, um, and we've also shown that um, the nickel MOF 74 provided the highest sensitivity to NO2 with a 725 time decrease in resistance compared to the other two. And now, when you compare it to uh, competing gases. Uh, so we were interested in what will SO2 interfere because in many industrial processes, if you have NO2, you have SO2 also. What about ambient air where you have 400 part per million CO2 and a 50% relative humidity? Um, and so we performed the exposures for 96 hours um, and uh, were able to show the selectivity versus these different components. And you see on, uh, well, let's just go to B, where you see that um, even with air and NO2, so all the components of air, which include uh, argon and CO2 and uh, nitrogen and water, that um, you still have an enormous uh, resistivity response. So the high selectivity on the atomic scale from the metal organic framework to our target gas of NO2 holds up in our sensor uh, based on uh, these results. And then, um, so we were just basically um, doing research and very excited about our results, but we ran into trouble because uh, if you drop the, the, the ID with the film on it, or if you sneezed or whatever, it would come flying off um, because it was just held electrostatically. So we undertook a process, um, pretty much this was a whole team effort, of figuring out a way to grow the metal organic framework directly on the IDE. And at first we thought, well, at least if we get it close to the platinum electrodes, we'll be fine. We went to the literature and there's a fair amount of um, information on how to functionalize uh, a silica surface or the glass surface. And we thought, well, we'll functionalize the surface. And then once it's functionalized, we'll be able to grow the moths and they'll be close to the platinum electrodes and we'll be good. Well, looking at the photographs on the upper right, we were better than we thought we could be, and we actually ended up covering everything, in particular the magnesium MOF-74, where we uh, covered all the platinum and all the glass. So now we have this coverage. Uh, it passes the ASTM uh, drop test, basically scratching and uh, scotch tape. So now we can mail it to collaborators and industrial partners for uh, scale up and testing. Um, and uh, when you look at the data on the lower right, you see a faster kinetics and a faster response. Um, and that is because the thin the films are so much thinner than the drop cast. So not only do we have a, a durable film, we actually have a faster response film. And I'm just gonna touch on this. We're doing a great deal of work for the Department of Defense and Department of Energy on various off gases that they need. And they wanted for very long times uh, and under different temperatures uh, and conditions. And so um, Will Bachman, who works with us, and Leo Small in particular, designed this, we call it the MOF Motel multi-chamber, where we can put gases in and different at different temperatures and different humidities and do long-term studies. Stephen Percival uh, is leading an effort on a paper that's uh, in review right now for a three-month cycling study. So that's really exciting for industrial applications. Okay, so in conclusion, I just want to show that um, what we've found from fundamental research is a class of materials, metal organic frameworks, which are nanoporous materials that are incredibly stable to acid gases, even in humidity. And it's based on their crystal chemistry um, and the elements used. And even with this rarity of fluorine incorporation, uh, it does not affect our binding and our stability. Uh, so that's the fundamental side. Turning to a very applied side, we can now use it for industrial and automatic, automatic caustic gas detectors with minimum power requirements, 
or interference from competing gases. And they're very tunable and selected for gases even with competing air. So what I hope I've shown is that um, by this tight combination of computational design, laboratory material synthesis and testing and characterization with real world mixed gas testing, we can both design materials quickly and validate them quickly. Um, and so it's really a, a dynamic, fun group where we are moving between basic research and applied research. And now I'm just going to take a second to thank, I'm not going to take every, everyone by chance, but I mean, these are just been a great team of young people that have come through the lab, uh, postdocs, many of whom have stayed at Sandia and interns. Um, and then the young staff I'm currently working with that are just phenomenal. And without, uh, I really couldn't, would not be anywhere without Dave Rademacher, our technologist um, extraordinaire who I've been working with for many years. So I thank them all. Um, and uh, our funding agencies. So thank you to them. And then a lot of people don't know what Sandia is. So I'm just going to take the opportunity to say it's a NNSA lab, uh, primarily based in Albuquerque, New Mexico and Livermore, California. We have about 14,000 plus employees and our fiscal year is October 1st through September 30th. If anyone's out there looking for a job, um, we're always looking for folks. That's the website. I just, I'm going to be very blunt. Our website is not user-friendly, but just be persistent and you'll do great. And if you want to go to the Kauai test facility, they only take two Sandians. So we're all competing for it anyway. You might want to just focus on Albuquerque. Uh, and so with that, I'll take questions and thank you for listening and coming in today. And uh, thank you to my team. Great. Thank you very much, Tina. I'm going to go ahead and give everybody a chance to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Hopefully that's where it is when you're looking at it and give everybody a moment to type in some questions. Uh, while they're doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and share some closing slides and we'll come back and see if there's any Q&A from there. That's okay. Uh, let's see here. I do wanna thank you all for logging in for today's AVS eTalk with Tina Nenoff. She presented on the design realization applications of gas and ion separations materials. Thank you, Tina. It was a wonderful presentation. A lot of information to pack in in a short period of time. We understand that for sure, uh, but thank you for doing that for us. And I do wanna remind people, if you have an idea for an AVS eTalk or an AVS webinar, please contact Matt Jordan or Dave Adams. They are the two people in charge of scheduling and we're looking for 2023 topics right now. So you're, we're open to suggestion. Uh, we do have one last short course uh, via the AVS Mid-Atlantic chapter on atomic layer deposition. That course is on Monday. So if you wanna register, I suggest doing it between now and Friday so we can get you the information. We are looking to schedule 2023 training. So we have courses by request form that will help us uh, determine what courses you would like to see. And to elaborate on some of our upcoming technical meetings, to round out 2022, we have the PACSURF meeting. This is a symposium on surfaces, coatings, and interfaces in December in Waikoloa, Hawaii. To kick off 2023, we have the conference on physics and chemistry of surfaces and interfaces in Redondo Beach, California. Going forward, you'll see we have quite a few technical meetings coming up. Uh, ICMCTF, ALD and ALE, MIOMD, uh, GOX or Gallium Oxide Workshop, and NIMBY. Uh, hopefully most of you know those abbreviations or you can read them while I'm listing it out. Our AVS events calendar on the AVS website will have those details month by month if you click through it. And finally, we just finished our AVS 68th International Symposium and Exhibition in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We are now looking forward to AVS 69 in November in Oregon, Portland, Oregon next year. So please check it out. That is also on our events calendar. Platinum membership, we're always looking for you to join us uh, with AVS and we have a wonderful community to join. You can find more out on the AVS website. And there's an evaluation form uh, in a separate browser. And from here, I'm gonna turn it over to Q&A for Tina. If you can see the Q&A in your screen, let me know. I okay, can. I'll let you go. Yeah, thanks. Um, so Mark gave a really good question. Do these sensors seem better versus existing sensors? They, Mark, it's a, that's a really good question. So every, everything, every application has its niche. Um, existing sensors, as I started in the sensors pr presentation, um, 
tend to either use uh, fuel cell-like technology where um, leaving them out in the field for a long period of time would be detrimental, or um, they tend to need heating elements. Um, and in many cases, um, so the way I didn't speak about it here, but we spent a lot of time initially in the sensor world working on iodine sensors, um, in particular for nuclear waste or nuclear accidents. And so one can envision leaving sensors all around uh, Fukushima precinct um, to see if there is a cloud of uh, moving in a direction after an accident or around nuclear reactors uh, before an accident, hopefully no accident. And so the thought is they would be out for a long time. So the ability to have something that is not uh, affected by the environment, that is small, that does not require power sources to be replaced, but will not uh, foul or uh, like a fuel cell with time. So that's one of the targets we were looking at. Uh, in other cases, um, uh, in other cases, we are looking at uh, in uh, military applications of aging munitions, where we are um, instead of taking apart uh, a warhead of some sort, you can add uh, the the sensor to the pallet that it's on, and you will have um, uh, the ability to target the gases coming off. I see your follow up question um, came quickly. Uh, these are our. It depends on, on what we're looking at. It might be slow in comparison to some of the commercial sensors, but those commercial sensors would not be able to exist and function for long periods of time without extra battery units or heating elements. And so that is not um, a value. Those other sensors are not of value to the military. So uh, it depends on what you're looking at, to tell you the truth. I hope that answered your question. Are there any other questions? If there are any other questions, please feel free to type them in the Q&A. We'll take another moment before we actually close out, just in case there are some people typing their questions in. And just a reminder, there is an evaluation form in a separate browser. We would appreciate any feedback you have regarding today's presentation um, and suggestions. And it looks like there is one more comment or question for you, Tina. I see that. I see Mark is not at all impressed with these sensors, but that's okay. <laughs> we um, actually today, Mara Schindelholtz, our colleague, is uh, not only has she won a national um, Department of Energy award for the state of our sensors, but also she's pitching them at a special session to venture capitalists in San Jose right now. So there's actually uh, plenty of market for this. It may just not be the market you're aware of, but thank you for your interest. Uh, which VC group? I, I can actually get it for you. It's a it's a national thing. Um, uh, Heather, do you want me to send it to you, and then you could provide it to Mark? Yes, that would be fine. Thank okay, you. That'll work. All right. All right, Mark, we'll get that information to you. Thank you. Any other questions from anybody? Feel free to type them in. If not, we'll go ahead and. Uh, Thank everybody for joining us today and thank you for your questions and feedback and please complete that evaluation form and there we go there was one more comment from mark as well oh i think i just did which vc group and oh is there another one? Oh, yeah one just came in below that chemical angel network okay good to know i'll let uh, mara know that All righty. I think we're good, Tina. Um, I don't see any additional questions coming in. I want to thank you for your time and presentation. Oh, my pleasure. Completely my and, pleasure. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you, everybody. And we'll go ahead and have you fill out that evaluation form. I will email it to you in case you don't see it in your browser. So be on the lookout for another email from me. And have a good day and hope to see you. Happy holidays to everyone and hope to see you at another eTalk webinar, short course, or conference. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care. Goodbye. Bye.